Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the OECD's Open Forum on Artificial Intelligence from Principles to Practice. My name is Audrey Plunk, and I head the OECD's Digital Economy Policy Division. Um, our division developed the AI principles that we'll be talking about today, and we're working on developing the OECD AI uh, Observatory. Uh, just a couple of words about the OECD for those of you who aren't familiar with our work. At the core, um, the OECD is an intergovernmental organization with 36 member countries that are all market economies and democracies in Europe, North America, and some in South America and Asia. But our reach is not only limited to developed countries. And we are increasingly engaged in work in developing countries through partnerships. We focus on economic and social policy. Analysis and statistics, so our work is often quite upstream in the policy process. We also develop international policy standards, such as the OECD's privacy guidelines, originally in 1980 and revised numerous times since then, and the AI policy principles that were just adopted this past May. I would like to say that stakeholders are closely involved in our work, particularly the division that I head, and we have formal advisory committees in place representing business, the technical community, civil society, and labor unions. I'm delighted that our incoming chair of the Committee on Digital Economy Policy, Mr. Yoichi Ida from Japan, will moderate today's session. Among many of his other achievements, Yoichi led the G20 discussions on AI that resulted in the G20 nations agreeing in June of this year to, set, uh, to a set of ethical guidelines for AI drawn directly from the OECD's AI principles. And with that, I will turn it over to Yoichi. Okay, uh, Audrey, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished speakers and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so uh, we would like to uh, uh, start uh, the very uh, fruitful discussion today. So let me uh, briefly explain outline of the session. First, uh, we will focus on policy frameworks for AI at the international level with highlight on the OECD works uh, on AI and uh, also some discussions at G7 and G20. Then we will listen to the uh, stakeholders' views and uh, priorities. After short interventions from discussants from Singapore and China, uh, then uh, if time allows, I, I will open the panel to the floor. So without further, further ado, uh, for, uh, our first presentation is from the OECD, uh, Ms. Karin Perset, uh, is uh, Administrator on AI Policy at Digital Economy Policy Division. Uh, she will present the process to develop the AI principles and also uh, foresee next, test, next steps for the uh, OECD to help uh, implement the principles. So Karin, uh, please take the floor. Um, thank you very much, Ida-san. Good morning. Uh, well, good afternoon, in fact, um, as it's noon. So I'll give a brief overview of the OECD's AI principles and next steps. Um, first, a little bit of background. Our uh, work on AI began after a G7 meeting in Takamatsu in 2016 that Ms. Yamada will say more about. And Japan encouraged the OECD uh, to conduct analysis on AI and to organize events. And these events led to a pretty broad consensus that high-level principles were needed for, uh, for AI to provide direction and agreement on top policy priorities for international cooperation. Um, so in 2018, we created an expert group uh, called IGO with members from about 20 governments, uh, business, uh, like uh, Caroline from Microsoft, who's here today, civil society, trade unions, academia, the technical community, like the IEEE that's rep also represented today, and other IGOs like the European Commission and UNESCO, who are also here today with us. Uh, so the principles were adopted um, in May this year by the 36 OECD countries as well as six partner countries. And then in June uh, of this year, G20 leaders committed to similar principles in Osaka. Um, so while the process to develop the principles was multi-stakeholder, the princes are in fact, the principles are in fact an intergovernmental agreement and the adherents are governments. Uh, it's not binding, but represents a strong political commitment to use these principles as a common framework for uh, national policies. Um, so, I w Ms. Yamada will present the principles themselves, um, but just to show you uh, a map that, that 
to visualize uh, the reach of these principles and the importance of the G20 co commitment to give a broad common framework worldwide. But it also shows the need to reach out to some regions uh, such as Africa, which are which are not uh, have not been closely involved uh, in the process uh, yet. Um, so back to the OECD principles, uh, they include um, five principles for the responsible stewardship of responsible A AI, um, i.e. systems that protect and benefit people and individuals, as well as five priority recommendations for national policies and international cooperation, so basically to help economies and societies benefit from AI. Um, So the principles were the beginning, and now we're focusing on implementation, and the OECD AI Policy Observatory is one of our, our major endeavors to move from principles to action and implementation and help policymakers in this journey. Um, so what is the observatory? Uh, we envisage it as a collaborative platform uh, that facilitates knowledge sharing, measurement, and analysis for trustworthy AI. Um, we're calling it OECD.AI and aim to launch it in February 2020. Um, so its char core characteristics are one, uh, multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, uh, because applications in one area of AI are increasingly transfer and bring lessons into other areas. Uh, two, that's evidence-based, and three, that's multi-stakeholder and cooperative, and that, that's really key, uh, because we're bringing together resources from partners from all stakeholder groups in a complementary manner. Um, so the observatory will provide resources structured around four main pillars. Uh, one, the AI principles and their implementation guidance uh, that provides a rationale uh, for each principle and explain what it means, uh, providing examples of actions and initiatives that can help implement these principles. Um, two, analysis in public policy areas impacted by AI, uh, areas uh, from, you know, in areas from science to uh, health, transportation, employment, or education. So this is bringing together analytical work uh, at the OECD, but also by partner institutions such as the European Commission, Science Direct, or Microsoft Research. Um, the third. The third pillar is trends in data. This is really a key area for, for us. So I'll just show you a, a preview of, of some of the, the, the elements we, we're going to include there. And four, a live repository or database of country and stakeholder initiatives. Um, so moving into the, um, moving into the, the preview I mentioned, I'd say, um, we'll have OECD metrics and measurements, uh, but also live data from partner institutions um, with the goal of showing from as many vantage points as possible where is AI being developed, where is it being used, funded, by who, how fast, and in which sectors. So, so this is a sneak preview of trends uh, of, in, of live, uh, live, research, live news taking place around the world. Um, and another, this is, this shows you uh, some of the work we've been doing on, on estimating uh, private equity investments in AI startup uh, across, across the world. Um, and this is another uh, sneak preview of trends in AI research powered by Microsoft Academic Graph uh, that really shows kind of the, the, the trends over time. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we dig into that data in much more detail in the observatory. Um, so last but not least, and again, also we're focusing on AI jobs and skills, which is a major uh, a, a major priority for policymakers everywhere, uh, and so just trying to show uh, where is demand for AI skills, what what type of AI skills are in demand, uh, etc. Um, and last but not least, um, we are developing we have developed actually uh, an interactive develop database of AI policies and initi initiatives from countries um, that they share and update through a survey. Uh, so to date, we have over 47 countries contributing and over 270 initial uh, individual AI policy initiatives and instruments. So this, this allows country, countries to compare their national AI policies interactively uh, and at both the aggregate level and then at very granular levels, uh, navigating through dashboards by country territories, types of policy instruments, uh, etc. So, so this was a short preview uh, of the AI Policy Observatory. Thank you. And, Back to you. 
Thank you, Karin. Uh, you said the uh, G20 uh, principles are similar to OECD principles, but actually they are uh, identical. So uh, G20 fully uh, owes to uh, OECD uh, for the uh, achievement. So let me introduce uh, uh, Ms. Makiko Yamada, uh, Vice Minister uh, of Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications from the Japanese government. Uh, she will tell us more uh, about the G7 discussions on AI and the significance of the AI uh, principles, uh, including in the G20 process. So please, uh, Ms. Ms. Yamada, please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Ida-san. And uh, so uh, it's my great pleasure to share with uh, you Japan's contribution to uh, international discussion on AI since 20, uh, 2016. And I, I have some slides here, so please have a look. And this first slide shows the recent uh, sequence of G7, G7 presidencies and how G7 discussions on AI has been proceeded. The st starting point was Japan. And uh, so uh, I myself was in charge of this discussion. And uh, so we hosted the G7 ICT minister meeting in Takamatsu uh, 2016. And the G7 ICT minister discussed wide range of issues in Japan and uh, with respect to AI. The highlight was the proposal from our minister, uh, Takaichi Sanae. She proposed the starting international discussion on AI at G7 and with the possibility of formulating a set of guidelines for AI research and development. And it, it envisaged the rapid development of AI technologies and its network, and as well as the opportunities and concerns. The discussion was succeeded and deepened by the following three G7 presidencies of Italy, Canada, and France. So you can uh, have a look. On, uh, so and I, I will not go too, mu too much in detail. And this is the material distributed for reference at the Takamatsu G7 meeting. It was the very draft of the list of items that the expert study group under our ministry was considering the guidelines on AI should cover. We believe that there should be an international uh, shared instrument on AI like the OECD privacy guidelines that many countries would refer in their policy making and because the impact on uh, by AI would be multiple when AI systems are interconnected with each other over networks. And Japan wished that the proposal with this draft would be the starting point of the discussion. And it was composed of eight principles on transparency, user assistance and uh, controllability, security, safety, privacy, ethics, and accountability. As shown in the screen, uh, if you compare this to the OECD's final accomplishment of the AI principles, many factors are in common, and we believe this draft was not bad for the first trial. And this slide, uh, shows the, our national policy on AI. Up until now, the Japanese government published an uh, AI strategy in June uh, this year. It has five priority areas that the government uh, focuses its effort to prepare for the AI adoption in the economy. And as part of the, this strategy, and uh, so group, uh, expert group developed the social principles of human-centric AI uh, this year. Uh, these principles were intended to be input into international discussion as our contribution to the global community. So please uh, have a look at the, uh, the, the slides, and uh, so number two. And uh, concerning the, the next slide, uh, Japan took the G20 presidency this year. It was a great opportunity to expand the uh, G7 discussion to the G20 level, knowing that the OECD was undertaking the work to develop Council recommendation on AI. And so we proposed and led the discussion on AI principles at G20 Digital Economy Task Force. Uh, many thanks to the great support from OECD, and G20 ministers agreed on G20 AI principles 
uh, which referring the OECD Council's recommendation of AI. G20I principles were the, then elevated to the leaders' level and welcomed by the G20 leaders in the leaders' declaration. So, we are missing the, the slide, okay. All right, so, uh, slide five, okay. And Japan, particularly the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications of Ministry, has supported the OECD's work on AI since 2016, after the G7 Takamas meeting. Our support to the OECD includes OECD's conference in the year 2017, uh, AI, Intelligent Machines, Smart Policies, two days epoch-making conference in Paris, and more than uh, 300 experts and policymakers from all over the world participated. And development of AI principles, uh, including active participation in AIGO, to academic Japanese experts, uh, Professor Sudo and Professor Hirano, uh, so they are uh, great friends of mine, uh, participated in the OECD's expert group discussion to cope with the principles on AI. And uh, publications, uh, artificial intelligence in society. We have been supporting the OECD analytical work on AI. This book puts together the OECD's analytical work on AI. Japan will continue to support to the work on AI, including the policy observatory presented by Karin a few minutes ago. And I would like to congratulate that and, and expect the OECD con continues to lead the international policy discussion on AI. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Yamada, uh, uh, for explaining all the way up until now. So uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Uh, Rob Strayer, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the State from the uh, US uh, government uh, in charge of cyber and international communications and information policy. Mr. Strayer will, in, uh, will provide the US government's perspective on the principles uh, and also their implementations. So Mr. Strayer, please take the floor. Thank you, dear son. Um, I don't need to tell all of you here how important AI will be to our future. I don't think you'd be in this room if it wasn't something that you cared about and know a lot about how it's going to transform potentially our lives in so many ways. Uh, it will also, because of those transformations to our society, have dramatic impacts on our future economic growth and on our national security. And it's for those reasons that AI really will be a key foreign policy initiative for all governments. And that's partly why uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, AI. Uh, we believe that AI will have dramatically positive impacts uh, if we channel it in the right way. Um, that is why we in the United States released a uh, national AI initiative in February that sets up a whole of nation approach, including uh, academia, civil society, government, and the private sector, as well as a strategy to work with like-minded partners on AI. Uh, very important to this strategy are two components. One is what we do domestically, and then secondly, what we do with foreign partners around the world. I'll start with the uh, engagement abroad, and uh, we've just heard an outline of the OECD principles. That was a very important step for uh, more than uh, two dozen democracies to come together around the set of key principles that embody our shared values. And important of those, among those is that the AI principles say that we should have human-centric AI, AI that's based on our views about privacy and of individual liberties and basic human rights. It's important that we have those basic human rights included in AI because there's dramatic paths that can be pursued, divergent paths that could be pursued relative to AI. We could see AI become a key enabler of uh, future success and growth and let humans reach uh, either in greater potentials of success, or we can see it used in authoritarian ways. In fact, we're already seeing authoritarian governments start to use some of the capabilities that are the uh, uh, underlying uh, uh, capabilities of AI. In uh, the Xinjiang province in China, we've seen uh, the use of AI technology through facial recognition 
to identify uh, the Uyghur population and then have those people sent to uh, camps. More than now, more than one million Uyghurs are now imprisoned in camps uh, in China uh, without any sort of due process. So there's two different uh, paths forward, one that would follow our shared values and one that doesn't follow our shared values. Uh, I want to compliment uh, uh, Vice Minister Yamada and uh, the Japanese government for their leadership this year in the G20 to amplify those uh, OECD uh, principles in the G20, which were also amplified in the G7 under the leadership of France. Um, and as mentioned earlier, too, that we're very interested in seeing how these principles are adopted into practical guidelines for the future. Uh, the OECD Policy Observatory uh, is going to be a key place where we can uh, see different policies that advance uh, AI in ways that are going to be consistent with our values, uh, our beliefs about having explainability and transparency, uh, as well as safety and security for AI. Uh, turning to the United States, uh, our National Science Foundation recently announced a National AI Research Institutes uh, program that will set up these institutes across the country. Uh, one of the initial focuses will be on having trustworthy AI. Our administration is also working on guidelines for regulatory and non-regulatory steps that agencies can take to advance AI. Uh, because AI relies on data and the need for large amounts of data, it's very important to have the right kind of data policies in place so that uh, this data can help uh, advance uh, future AI initiatives. So in closing, I want to thank uh, the OECD uh, for the work on the AI principles and the way they convened uh, so many of us together to produce those, those principles. Um, it's going to be very important that we work together uh, as democracies and those that share similar values uh, in the years ahead in this space and that we uh, ensure that there continues to be a, a regulatory foundation around the world uh, with regard to data and, and, uh, and, and regard, regarding uh, digital technologies that sets, sets up companies in a way that they're going to be able to continue to innovate uh, in this field. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spreya. Uh, actually, I uh, enjoyed a very strong support by the U uh, US government uh, when we uh, worked together for G20 process. So uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Ms. Uh, Caroline Ingwen, uh, Director of Technology Policy from Microsoft. Uh, Ms. Ingwen was uh, one of the core members uh, of the OECD's expert group on AI, uh, famous as IGO, and is also closely involved in the development of the OECD uh, AI Policy Observatory. So uh, I expect that she will provide the business perspective on priorities or to implement the AI principles. So Ms. Ingwen, uh, please take the floor. Thank you very much, um, ida -san. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what um, I'll share about is really the business perspectives into this process. As um, Microsoft, we recognize early on the potential of AI to transform the world and improve all of our lives collectively. Uh, as part of that, however, you know, this potential won't be realized if AI is not trustworthy. So very early on, in about the middle of 2016, Microsoft published, our CEO published an article on the importance of human-centric AI, follow up the year after by a set of our own principles. The intention there really is to promote awareness and potential issues, but also the fact that you know, uh, we need to all work together to foster trust if we are going to enable broader adoption of AI. We were very excited to be a part of the IGO process at the OECD, uh, especially because the OECD relies on an evidence-based approach to policy making. Um, and furthermore, during that process, what was really unique was the recognition that all actors, in other words, those, all of those who have an active role in an AI system life cycle, and not just the tech providers, but also those that deploy, operate, and maintain AI systems have roles in promoting and implementing the principles for responsible stewardship of responsible AI. Uh, what I'd have to say is that multi-stakeholder process was one of the best experience, and it really demonstrated the true benefits of the values that each stakeholder can bring to the table. 
So what's essential at this point is to convert these high-level principles to practice. As a technology provider, for us, this has two dimensions. Firstly, develop AI solutions and technologies that are trustworthy and work to promote the importance of such solutions throughout the broader AI ecosystem. I'll come back to that. But secondly, it is about providing data and AI to enable evidence-based policy development and explore new models for public-private partnership where AI tools can enable more informed and agile policy making. So back to the first one in terms of developing trustworthy AI, internally we're doing this from a couple of different ways. We're developing technology from our Microsoft research uh, that where AI can be a part of the solution to implement some of the principles. For example, uh, promoting things like data sheets for data sets to make sure that everyone understands what's in the data set. Uh, promoting, developing technology such as word embedding where words that are biased can be detected. Uh, and promoting risk management practices as a practice throughout the AI development life cycle that can identify potential risks um, and mitigate and find solutions. We are then also working with an external organization, a partnership on AI, to implement and share best practices on an initiative called About ML, uh, where the notion and the, of the objective of the initiative is to capture best practices in documenting the development of learning models and data sets. So this is a best practice in terms of accountability. Internally, we have established an Office of Responsible <coughs> AI to provide guidelines for our engineering um, and also services group and we form an AI ethics in engineering and research, which is a senior level um, team that is responsible for recommendations in terms of uh, implementation of AI in sensitive uses. In terms of work with others in our ecosystems and other stakeholders, in addition to the partnership on AI, Microsoft Asia has also launched a new project actually in Singapore uh, working um, in terms of implementation of responsible AI in the financial services industry. We've just released uh, last week a white paper uh, sharing learnings from the implementation of responsible AI principles in the financial sector. Last week, we also launched at the Women's Forum an AI and Women Daring Circle um, on how women can empower AI and how AI can empower women inclusively. Secondly, with respect to providing data to enable more evidence-based and agile policy making, as Karin mentioned, we're working with the OECD to provide Microsoft Academic Graph, which is um, a graph that contains uh, basically scientific publication records, including relationships between researchers across countries. Um, authors, institutions, journals, and field of study. Secondly, we're also contributing the LinkedIn economic graph data, which is a digital representation of the global economy regarding skills, both supply and demand, and trends of needed skills, um, including um, talent migration, etc. And the notion is that both of these will enable more evidence-based policy making. We look forward to continuing to work with the OECD and all of you how, on how to share um, and in terms of practices on how to build trustworthy AI and to create evidence that can enable more informed policy making. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Uh, actually, to be honest, uh, I regularly uh, learn uh, from your colleague based in Tokyo, and uh, I believe uh, that uh, it's a strong evidence for, of the benefit of a private uh, public partnership or multi stakeholder approach. So let me introduce uh, uh, Mr. Nina. Uh, Hanna. Uh, Mr. Hanna is the co-chair of the uh, policy committee of the uh, IEEE Standards Association's Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. Uh, he will provide a uh, tech community's perspective. So Mr. Hanna, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Yochi san uh, It is uh, quite a great pleasure to be here on the panel among some, some very esteemed speakers um, who represents many of the organizations that have been involved in uh, what I would only characterize as a monumental effort to develop the OECD principles and you know building a key consensus among many organizations that are that come from you know multi that represent multi stakeholder groups um, and building very key coalitions to agree on what those principles that should underline 
the development of what one would call trustworthy AI, uh, an AI or an environment where innovation is key and an environment where um, ethical principles really underline the development and deployment in use. Um, and that environment, of course, um, is built on principles that the OECD, the IEEE Global Initiative, Many organizations have worked on, of course, many of the principles that were published by um, key allies, for example, the private sector like you know Microsoft and IBM and others and UNESCO and um, what that we're going to hear about in a minute. Uh, but the Global Initiative essentially is an effort that started in 2015, um, and its goal was to be around the development of the rules or the standards, the technical standards that would underline you know, how you know, technology components, how the manufacturers of technology, the, the, the researchers, the academics, are going to build you know, all of these AI tools that would be built on three key pillars. Um, and to us, the three key pillars are universal human values that stem from an understanding of you know, and ad, an the advancement of the basic human rights as we understand them, um, of, of, of all humans, political self-determination and data agency, and third is technical dependability. Um, these uh, principles that have been published um, include things that might differ in, you know, the nomenclature, you know, but but the, I, the the ideas or you know the principles are you know very very common and understood by, you know, the OECD, the high level expert group principles that were published, and the IEEE's and others, um, and of course that includes uh, transparency, accountability, technical dependability, reduction of algorithmic bias, uh, which is very important for obvious reasons. Um, and 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 essentially inclusivity and um, and and other you know principles, um, and we thought that the tools how we're going to accomplish this, uh, the very first thing that we have worked on was the ethically aligned design framework. Uh, there was an initiative, you know, uh, the document that has been launched in March, the first edition, after following multiple versions that were published in the years prior. Um, a very, it's a very exhaustive document, and I and I invite you all to you know read it. We are going through a process of revising it, adding more chapters, and adding more uh, content there. So it doesn't hurt to have more partners uh, that represents additional geographies that we have not worked with before. And um, you know the the and I would advise you to look at ethics uh, in action .ieee .org, uh, to look at the ethically aligned design document. Uh, on top of that, there are the 14 standards, the P7000 series, um, and certification processes and other that's called ECPAS and other initiatives that um, includes you know, engaging governments in the process of creation uh, of standards um, and, and so on. And of course, there are multiple programs where you know, part of IEEE is IEEE USA that is focused on working with uh, the US government, the executive, and the legislative branch. Um, and from also from you know from as chair of another committee a policy committee inside IEEE USA we work with the House of Representatives and the Senate AI caucuses, and we've had multiple you know and I'm not going to you know um, some of the initiatives that Secretary Schreyer have mentioned and the documents that were published by the White House initiatives in the Department of State of course that focus very much on diplomacy and building much of that consensus. There's a lot of things that have come following many of these conversations, you know, a congressional resolution and, you know, the Defense Innovation Board, uh, amazing document, by the way, on the use of, um, you know, um, AI and defense and what are those ethical principles that should be um, uh, underlining that use. Um, so to conclude, really, um, and I'll be remiss if I do not mention that uh, we're very, very thankful that we're working with OECD. It's such a great opportunity that we are really reforming the creation of, you know, what might amount to a uniform regulatory, uh, um, you know, basis, f so that you know we have a regulation of how we. Um, you know, for commerce, we're creating environments where innovation can flourish, and so on, where we have, you know, good public-private partnerships that are built to increase that trustworthiness in the technology. Um, what we are very focused on right now, and that's the scope of the projects we are building, and the initiatives is practice, is, is from principles <laughs> to practice, and we're focusing on those implementations. A lot of that will focus on deploying those standards, working with uh, public policy makers, and um, engaging in more and more of these conversations with the OECD, with the UN groups, and so on. So um, pleasure to be on the panel. Thank you very much.
Um, and I will leave it at here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Uh, actually, uh, we also learned uh, quite a lot from the uh, IEEE's early work uh, on AI. So next, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Ms. Valeria uh, Milanes, uh, an Executive Director of ADC uh, Association for Civil Rights, and also C uh, CS Isaac, Steering Committee member. So she will provide a civil society's perspective. So uh, Ms. Milanes, please take the floor. Well, thank you very much. I truly appreciate the invitation because I want to highlight that I represent a civil society organization that is based in Argentina, which is basically Latin America, which I'm really grateful that we can have voice here because all regions should be represented in this discussion. Uh, being Argentinian and being from a civil society organization from Argentina, I had the honor to be part of the Civil 20 Troika that delivered to Prime Minister Aver last April the Civil 20 Policy Pack that was elaborated for more than 500 civil society organizations from all over the world that contain recommendations for the Digital Economy Task Group, including recommendations on AI and related to the work that civil society have done uh, with the OECD principles, I like to highlight and share with you which was one of the main input that civil society used, that it was a document delivered and elaborated by the Public Voice, which is a collective of civil society organizations also, because we work together, it's a, it's a huge amount of work. And the public voice um, is working on privacy and data protection issues since 2009. At that time, the public voice elaborated and released the Madrid Declaration, which was the first one on its kind, addressing privacy protection, identifying new challenges, and calling for concrete actions. Almost 10 years later, in 2018, the public voice jointly elaborated universal guidance for artificial intelligence, the UGAI guidance. This document was part of the input that civil society representatives working with the OECD provided in the matter. As it was stated in the introduction of said document, the rise of artificial intelligence uh, decision making implicates fundamental rights of fairness, accessibility, and transparency. Modern data analysis produces significant outcomes that have real-life consequences for people in employment, housing, credit, commerce, and criminal sentencing. The universal guidance of artificial intelligence were proposed to inform and improve the design of and use of artificial intelligence. The public voice also stated that the primary responsibility for AI systems must reside with those institutions that found, develop, and deploy these AI systems. The guidelines are 12, I will name it quickly, the right to transparency, the right to human determination, the identification obligation, which means the, the institution responsible for the uh, artificial intelligence system must be known to the public, fairness obligation, assessment and accountability obligation, accuracy, reliability, and validity obligation, data quality obligation, public safety obligation, cybersecurity obligation, prohibition on secret profiling, prohibition on unitary scoring, and the 12th is termination obligation, which, which refers that an institution that has established an artificial intelligence system at, um, sorry, at firm, at affirmative obligation, has the affirmative obligation to terminate the system if human control of the system is no longer possible. So the, these guidance can be found in the publicvoice.org uh, are there, so I invite you to read them in extension. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Milanes. Uh, actually, uh uh, apart from your uh, recommendations to Mr. Uh, Abe, uh, we also had a very good input from the Japanese chapter of C20, and the voice of civil society is always very important for the government. So let me introduce uh, uh, next uh, Ms. Uh, Sasha Rubel from UNESCO. Uh, 
Uh, she's a program specialist at Knowledge Society's Division of, of Communication and Information Sector and, uh, and in charge of uh, organizing the UNESCO's discussion on AI. So she will share UNESCO's perspective. So uh, Ms. Rubel, please take the floor. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'd like to start first by congratulating Audrey on her recent appointment and uh, also congratulating Karine uh, with her excellent team, uh, Nobu, Luis, and Galia, for the great work that they've been doing in uh, coordinating the adoption of the OECD AI principles at the G20 level, as well as an exemplary report, AI and Society, that underlines very clearly the way in which AI is transforming the way we live, the way we work, and the way we relate. I'd also like to congratulate you, Mr. Yoichi Ida, for the incoming chair position of the CDEP, as well as the government of Japan for their exemplary work in leading international reflections in the field of the ethical dimensions of AI, and your support to UNESCO in this field specifically. I'd like for the next couple minutes just to introduce very briefly UNESCO's perspective and priorities as it concerns AI policy, and then uh, very clearly underline the link between UNESCO's work and the ongoing work of the OECD OECD, with whom we are working very closely. As it concerns our perspective and priorities on AI policy, AI has a direct impact on our fields of competence. For those who may not know, uh, we work across five sectors with two global priorities. In the education sector, it is changing the way in which we think about teaching and learning and access to digital skills and local content and multilingualism. In the natural and human sciences, it is changing the way we think about environmental management, scientific research, and philosophical reflections on AI and its impact on how we co-design the future we want. In the culture sector, it changes the way in which we can preserve and promote cultural heritage, but also creative industries and cultural diversity. In our work on communication and information, it changes how we think about access to information, how we ensure the translation of human rights offline into the online environment in the age of AI, and it has a direct impact on one of the human rights that UNESCO works very concretely on, which is the questions of freedom of expression. AI changes the way in which we think about disinformation. It changes the way in which we access information and it changes the field of journalism more broadly. AI also directly impacts our two global priorities. It impacts our global priority gender. AI and algorithmic bias is a huge issue as it concerns not only addressing issues related to bi embedded bias in algorithms, but also ensuring women are not only consumers, but also producers of AI solutions. It also changes the way in which we think about what we call our priority Africa. The growing digital divide cannot become larger by leaving the global south behind and positioning the global south as consumers and not producers of local solutions using AI for the future they want. Lastly, it changes the way in which we think about democracy. I will cite uh, the managing director of the IEEE when he talks about AI. He constantly says uh, in his wonderful Greek accent, democracy, democracy. Democracy, democracy, and AI changes the way in which we think about these democratic processes. So this is kind of an overview of some of the priorities that we are looking at thematically, concretely, what are we doing? UNESCO is working with many partners here at the table and also in the audience uh, to look at how to ensure that young people and marginalized groups and women are equipped with the necessary digital literacy skills and media and information literacy to engage actively in the era of AI. We are also looking at how to empower institutions in the governance of AI by ensuring public policy support. In order to develop informed public policies, we need data. Data is also the lifeblood of democracy, and we are working very closely with organizations like the OECD in order to provide support to member states to ensure informed public policy development based on gaps analysis and indicators. We are addressing very concretely, as I mentioned earlier, questions of gender bias, and I invite you to read our report. All of our uh, work is published uh, on open access online called I'd Blush If I Could, which looks, for example, at the impact of voice assistance as it concerns gender bias in AI. I'd like to congratulate Microsoft for the launch of the Women in AI Daring Circle, for which UNESCO is an institutional partner at the Women's Forum on Economy and Society last week. This is absolutely essential so that we can change 
change the narrative as it concerns AI, both in terms of women's presence in AI and also the presence of the Global South. There are incredible innovations coming out of the Global South as it concerns AI solutions. The center of Google, for example, dedicated to AI is in Accra, and this is not by chance. Lastly, one of the things that we are working on, building on our Internet Universality Framework, which was adopted in 2015 by our 193 member states, is looking at how to promote what we call a Rome approach to digital transformation, including AI. And our Rome approach is based on four principles, that digital transformation and the development of AI should be rights-based, should be open, should be accessible, and should be multi-stakeholder. And in the spirit of this multi-stakeholder approach, last uh, week on November 21st at our general conference, our member states decided to mandate UNESCO to begin a standard setting process that will lead uh, in two years to a non-binding legal, fr non legal framework on the ethical dimensions of AI. In this process, UNESCO will uh, work not only with our member states and an ad hoc expert group, but also stakeholders from the pri public and private sector, from the technical community, from media and academia, civil society, and international organizations to come together to discuss, at the heart of UNESCO's deliberative work, the elaboration of this instrument. In this process, we will also be undertaking a civic forum in partnership with the Future Society, the Quebec Institute of Artificial Intelligence, and the University of Montréal to engage otherwise marginalized groups in a collective intelligence exercise to co-design this work. In closing, I'd just like to underline, you can tell I get very passionate about this work on AI. I think I might have gone over a couple, a couple seconds. I'd like to just underline uh, the linkages with the work of the OECD in this field. Recently at a side event, Secretary General Guria underlined that we are all learning from each other and we will be working very closely with the OECD uh, in uh, their public policy priorities. Their focus is on AI governance and good practice and economic and technical aspects and very much upstream. We will be translating this on the ground in our field offices around the world. Our approach is very complementary and in this regard we will work on the development of indicators for public policy development, work jointly in the observatory to ensure translation from from policy to practice involving the private sector from the beginning. And we hope also that the OECD will actively participate in our working group going forward in the framework of the elaboration of the standard setting instrument that will build on the excellent work that you have already done. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Sasha. Uh, it's very much impressive. I, I don't say, never say uh, rare, but to see uh, these two very important international organizations are uh, working closely. So uh, finally, let me introduce uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Kasia Gogo from EU. Uh, she's an advisor for digital uh, affairs and telecommunications at the delegation of European Union to the United Nations. Uh, she will share the European Commission's perspective. So uh, Sasha, uh, I'm sorry, Kasia, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, let me quickly use the three or four minutes that I have to present the European Commission's priorities on AI policy and also how we have been working with OECD. So the first thing that I would like to say is that uh, the Commission and the OECD have been working cl very closely in this area and therefore um, the EU's priorities are well reflected in the OECD recommendation on AI. Uh, essentially, what these priorities are, I could cluster them in three, uh, in three areas. First of all, investment. Secondly, ethical and normative frameworks. And uh, thirdly, transformation of the society and the labor markets. Uh, when it comes to investments, uh, the European Commission and our member states are very well aware of the fact that for Europe to be competitive in this area, we have to invest more. Uh, one of the um, issues that we currently have on the table is to boost uh, the investments in AI in the EU research and financing programs. To give you two examples of what we are planning to put our resource into, it is about upgrading the European research infrastructure by creating a European network of AI excellence centers, and basically these centers will put together the best European research teams in order to work on AI development and deployment. 
and they will also create synergies between industry and research and boost R&D capacities in key sectors such as high performance computing, robotics and IoT infrastructure. The second example that I would like to give is about data. Of course, we are all aware that data is a key asset for AI applications. And in this respect, the European Commission proposed to create common European data spaces to be financed under the next financial framework of the EU, which will help enhance access to data across all industrial sectors and based on agreed frameworks for data sharing. And we are currently having discussions with experts from various sectors, such as health, energy, agriculture, manufacturing, to understand what are the needs of each sector when it comes to uh, data for AI applications. Um, moving to ethical and normative framework, which has been recognized uh, here by previous speakers, uh, one thing that you might be aware of is that the European Commission created a high-level expert group on AI, which also came up with EU guidelines on trustworthy AI um, that have been published in April 2019. These guidelines cont contain an assessment list which allows the private sector and all interested stakeholders to pilot them in real life. And this piloting is currently taking place until the 1st of December. So I encourage also those who have not yet participated to join. Um, the second thing on the ethical and normative framework that I would like to say is that the EU legislation already applies to AI as it applies to other technologies. Uh, so to give a few examples, data protection legislation, consumer protection, cybersecurity, or non-discrimination legislation already applies to AI. However, for issues which might need special attention and where updates of legislation might be needed, uh, you might have heard about an announcement of the European Commission that the new college will come up with an initiative on AI in the first 100 days uh, in office. Um, moving to the third point, which is about transformation of labour markets, here the European Commission is working together with the Member States on issues such as improving skills through training, lifelong learning, etc. Um, mindful of time, I will briefly explain the, how we work with the OECD. So, first of all, it has been a very practical and hands-on hands approach, meaning that our experts participated in the development of OECD guidelines and OECD was also invited to participate in the work of the high-level expert group of the European Commission. <coughs> It is also a forward-looking partnership, so we are hoping to work with the OECD um, in, uh, in at least two areas, such as Pillar 4 of the Policy Observatory, which is about monitoring national AI uh, policies and strategies, and measurement of AI, because of course statistics are key to um, be able to develop informed policies. And with this, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Kasia, uh, for sharing the uh, information uh, with us. So we are running out of the time, but uh, before we go to uh, some questions, uh, 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 let me invite two commenters from the floor, uh, from Singapore and uh, uh, China. So first, uh, let me uh, invite Mr. Charles Chu from uh, Infocom uh, Media Development Authority of Singapore. So please, Mr. Chu. Yes, it's on. Um, very good morning. Um, I've got two minutes, I know. Um, so let me just make a few points. Um, Singapore, of course, we believe in the power of AI. As uh, Robert said, we wouldn't be here if we didn't believe in it. Uh, but more importantly, we believe the power of AI needs to be complemented by trust and confidence in the system. What this means for us is the development of AI models by data scientists and the likes cannot be done in isolation from the consumers and the users who rely on AI solutions. Second, high-level principles are, of course, very, very important, and we congratulate the OECD as well as the G20 Presidency Japan for adopting these principles. However, this is an important yet insufficient step. High-level principles need to be converted into implementable practice, uh, implementable practice that companies adopting AI solutions can use. 
Uh, we understand the OECD is already doing work on this, uh, and for Singapore, we are as well. Uh, we've adopted a model AI governance framework in January this year. Uh, no surprises, it relies on two very broad principles. One is that decision-making needs to be explainable, transparent, and fair. And second, AI solutions must be human-centric. But perhaps the more important part of the AI, uh, the model framework, is that it converts high-level ethical principles on AI into implementable practices. At the heart of the model, we're looking at very detailed and readily implementable guidance to the private sector to address ethical issues and governance issues. And we go down to quite granular level in terms of AI governance structures, risk management, and how you communicate with your customers. Uh, our model framework is a living document, and we are currently reviewing it with a view to including some use cases from the industry which we think will be relevant, and we will find another opportunity to share this with the group. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, so uh, uh, then let me invite Ms. Xiao Zhang uh, from uh, uh, China uh, CSE and CNNIC. Uh, she will uh, share uh, with us China's uh, uh, perspective. So, uh, Madam Zhang, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think China is very open for international collaboration and committed to G20 mechanism. mechanism. And I think we highly, highly respect and emphasize the importance of governance of AI. And this year, the government issues the first governance principle of AI in the national level. Uh, it's called the responsible AI. And today, I think we have some principles and some concepts so similar, uh, like uh, reliable and responsible, risk management, trustworthy, human-centric agile, and also something related to labor, labor and training. And one thing I think uh, uh, also, also China also stressed the importance of development of AI, because we think, uh, uh, I think it's uh, most important in character of AI is that it's empowering, because digital economy is the most important part, some very important part of the new economy. And AI is the core power of new of the digital economy. So it's it's uh, internet plus in the fact in the past, but it could be AI plus in the future. It's very important for the development. So the government also puts emphasis uh, on the AI to uh, serve the people's livelihood to make a benefit all, and also like to reduce poverty. So that's a priority. So we also think also it's time for us to think of the role of machine and people. So we have uh, actually a lot of discussion and for the civil society, that's something that they call for tech, tech for social goods and a lot of discussion. So I think after we had the WIC, the World Internet Conference in Wuzhen Summit each year in the end of the October. Mm -hmm. And each year we have a lot of uh, guests from different uh, backgrounds talking about AI and I have some very good discussion, and I welcome you to. Uh, I'm also I'm running this uh, platform, WIC, and thank you. Thank you, Madam Zhang. Uh, actually, it was very impressive for me personally uh, to, to reach an agreement uh, on G20 uh, principles uh, with the Chinese government, too. So uh, we uh, need to skip some of the plan, and uh, uh, I want to go directly to the questions uh, possibly taken from online uh, participants. Okay, so there's no one. So uh, uh, let me uh, ask the floor. Uh, maybe I, I, I hope I can take one or two questions from the floor to the panelists. So uh, the lady over there, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Marie-Laure Lemineur from ECPA International, Children's Rights Organization. So um, it is estimated that one in three internet users are children, people and uh, individuals under 18 years old. So in design, I'm curious to hear, in designing those governance policy framework, uh, have you ever considered to uh, include the perspective of children 
number one, and two, uh, have you considered to assess the impact on AI on the lives of children as internet users? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I take uh, one more question. Okay, please. Hello, my name is Maria Mertzenbro Kamura and I come from the Youth IGF Summit. I had a question regarding the implementation of the OECD principles because I've read that accountability is kind of limited or defined by the state of the art and there is this element of explainability. Um, would you recommend abstaining from, for instance, using AI systems whenever the state of the art does not allow for proper explainability in plain words? Or do you think that even though it may not be exactly easy to disclose, it's a still viable? Um, because sometimes I feel that the difficulties in implementing these principles, I wonder how some AI systems or decisions taken by, by an artificial intelligence can be explained, taking into account the state of the art. So we continue using them in all fields, or will you restrain its use until the state of the art allows for the full implementation of all these ethical and normative requirements? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, let me invite uh, any volunteer uh, from the panelists to respond to the questions. So first question, who can respond? So thank you very much for that question as it concerns involvement of children in the elaboration of governance principles and also the impact of AI on the lives of children. Uh, at UNESCO, we are working very actively to develop uh, AI literacy toolkits in the framework of what we call our ICT CFT framework for teachers, which not only teaches teachers how to integrate questions of AI literacy into the classroom, but also developing uh, open source educational tools that can be used in the classrooms so that children understand what AI is, can engage with it and then also uh, as they grow up uh, use it to produce uh, solutions. There's also more broadly our work on uh, what we call MIL, Media and Information Literacy, which has uh, toolkits from uh, children up to adults to make sure that the information is available and that they can engage actively and in an informed way intricately linked to the work on explainability. Okay, thank you very much. So for the second question, uh, who can respond? Maybe Karin. Um, yes, per perhaps a, a non-response, which is uh, to, to, to say that there's not a general rule, I think, that we can apply in those cases. I think that, and this is something that, that, is, is that we put forward in the in the principles on AI that really it's context dependent and it's going to rely on a risk uh, assessment approach mm -hmm. and, and therefore there's no blanket rule. Uh, you, you, it, it's going to depend on the risks and, and whether they're uh, proportionate with the, the benefits yeah. or not. Um, and so we're not going to have a one size fits all answer for this one. Um, thank you. Any more comments? Please. The very short answer on explainability here is that there is a very important role for um, research and development. And one, some, you know, something really quick that comes to mind is that itself, to develop the tools that will implement the explainability of something like deep learning, let's say, there's a lot of research that has to be put in. And what that means is there has to be a lot of involvement. The U.S. government and you know probably Secretary Schreyer can talk about that really quickly. But you know a program that comes to mind is XAI, Explainable AI. That's a program that DARPA is driving. Uh, the National Science Foundation, through their work of the AI National Institutes, uh, are prioritizing you know the ethical principles. And one of them is trustworthiness, fairness, and one of them is also explainability as well. However, you want to define the paradigm that tools themselves are still not developed yet. And to the, to, the, to the point that the gentleman from Singapore has actually made in the implementation themselves, as you know, we often say, the ecosystem itself of you know, creating the measures um, of, of you know, let's say liability or evaluating risk and so on, that will be based on you know, curating data and risk assessments and all of that, that's work that, for example, in the US, NIST works on as well. There's a federal engagement plan in the United States a lot of federal agencies are going to be involved in developing these sort of standards. Now, in the liabilities, my very short answer to that, or you know, in the implementation, my very short answer to that, there is a big role to, I mean, it's, I think it's kind of the time where we start building 
um, you know, regulatory sandboxes or technology sandboxes where we try with a, within a limited scope, limited data, limited impact, uh, and then see how things, you know, basically turn out. Um, that will take very, very close collaboration, a lot of uh, government involvement, and a lot of research from the private sector as well. So I'll leave it at here. With respect to, um, thank you very much for your question around explainability. I think one thing to, a couple of things to keep in mind. One thing is AI is just a tool. It's a computing tool. And how, and going back to reinforce something that Galene said, it's about how you use it. There needs to be um, subject matter experts um, in term, an appropriate governance process to ensure that the tool is used appropriately, that the tool can be understood, as well as guardlines, um, guardrails and guidelines are, are given. Uh, from that perspective, as part of the overall process and ecosystem, whether it's a technology developer or a technology implementer or maintenance, uh, there needs to be multi, um, you know, first of all, interdisciplinary uh, and diverse uh, perspectives included with throughout that whole process. And it goes back to a point that Karine made, which is that, you know, for the given context, what is the risk management framework that's used so that the risk can be understood all throughout the life cycle of the technology, the solutions, the systems, et cetera, and then there needs to be um, solutions identified, you know, et cetera, so that that can then become a tool for accountability. This is the, the project that we're working on with respect to ML. Um, just one thing, it's not just a technology provider, it takes everyone involved in the life cycle of, of the system. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much So uh, very uh, good uh, responses and uh, I want to uh, take more questions and answers, but uh, our time is already exhausted. And uh, uh, although the uh, time was uh, limited, uh, I believe uh, we had a very uh, informative and productive session. And uh, at, uh, at last, uh, not but least, uh, let me express uh, my uh, gratitude to uh, Nobu Nishigata for all the work for arranging this uh, very important uh, session. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope, uh, uh, we, uh, I believe uh, uh, the OECD will continue the very important work on uh, AI, and we hope we will see each other ne next week. Uh, next, uh, next year in Warsaw. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the uh, end of the session, and uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us, and please join me uh, to give a hand to the speakers.